I don't know when the last time you had a really good cry was, <clears throat> but if you need one, uh, there's a book that came out about 11 years ago. It's been a while. It's, it's sold like 5 million copies. You can also just YouTube this, what I'm about to tell you, and it's available there. But it's called <clears throat> The Last Lecture by Randy Pausch. Any, anybody even heard of this? Ever heard of this? The Last Lecture? Okay, a few of you. Um, it's a, a professor at Carnegie Mellon, I think. Um, uh, he uh, uh, realizes he's got a terminal disease and this, this cancer is going to kill him and so he gives one last lecture and in this he tries to pour everything he can into his listeners and he talks about achieving your childhood dreams and he talks about making the most of your life and at the end in the book I noticed it's really hard the last chapters for some reason are really blurry because you're sobbing uncontrollably but uh, as you get to the end he, he talks about how it's not really for his students and it's not really for you dear reader I'm doing this for my kids and you're like ah, it's a, you know and I, um, uh, I you know I remember watching a movie one time where it's kind of the same setup and the guy knew he wasn't going to be there to teach his uh, kid and, 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 and he finds out he's terminal while his wife's pregnant and they find out it's, it's going to be a son and so the whole movie is him like filming it, he's making these videos of him teaching his unborn son how to shave okay son you know he's, he's out there like throwing up a football and he's like here's how to throw a perfect spiral all the things that he wants to teach his son that he's not gonna be alive to do it and I'm watching this movie going Jackie next time I pick the movie okay this is awful like why are we doing this to ourselves it's supposed to be you know, eating popcorn oh that's tragic yeah so I don't know why I do this stuff but but there's something powerful right Hollywood knows it there's something powerful about last that last discourse that last those last words what am I going to say even as I'm saying that you're imagining yourself what would you want to get across to people you know we get to see Jesus's last discourse they call it and turn with me to John chapter 13 this is it chapters 1 through 11 were all about his life and then chapter 12 is the mighty hinge upon which the door of the gospel of John swings and now we're headed to Jerusalem now Jesus has come and the, the seven signs prove who he is right he's he's fed the 5,000 he's healed the man at the pool he's he's raised Lazarus from the dead and that's the turning point that's when they knew they had to kill him and he's marching like a drumbeat to Jerusalem and here it comes and so this is his last chance theologians call John 13 begins what's called his final discourse or his farewell discourse and of all the things he could talk about of all the topics right he knows he's gonna he's gonna be crucified dead buried resurrected ascending on high the Holy Spirit's gonna come of all the things he could choose to talk about it's incredible of all the topics he picks of all the things he could talk about he picks power authority power what to do with power it's kind of Kind of a head scratcher, right? I mean, you, of all the things that Jesus could talk to these 12 guys about that he's poured into, he's had three years of ministering with them, of all the topics he talks about, power. And I want to see how this applies to us. I don't want to get ahead of myself, but power and power dynamics, I don't know if we talk a lot about it in church, but we should because they're everywhere. And power and the way people use power and authority touches your life in all sorts of ways. Some of you are students. Some of you remember being students. Did you ever have a college uh, professor or that, that teacher? That professor had power over you, right? They, they had your grade point average, right? They, they had knowledge, but we've all had it. There, there are certain college professors, they, they use that knowledge over a discipline or teaching you how to do something, and they take that and they bring out the best in you. And they illuminate things that you never saw before, and it's incredible. They use that power to, like, build you up and bring out stuff you didn't even know was inside of you. And then there's other professors who use their power to crush your soul, right? It's like they're on a power trip. It's like they love the fact that they know stuff you don't know. You know what I mean, right? What, what are they doing? The use, the proper use or the misuse of power all the time, right? You, come on, you've had a boss or maybe you've been a boss where they, they, you brought out the best in people. You've also had a boss who was on a power trip who you just, you work for, and you go, did you not, like, did you not get enough hugs as a child? Like, what is happening here, right? And you go, how does this happen? It's the abuse or misuse of power. It affects you. Parents, believe it or not, you have power over your children. 
I know some days it's close. <laughs> if you'll stop, cry, please, if you'll go to bed, I'll give you anything. I understand. But you are God's agent of authority in their life. So that, the reason we teach our kids to say yes and no, to be obedient and to properly, yes sir, no sir, and all that stuff, and yes ma'am, the reason we teach them to come under loving authority is so that they'll learn little by little to say yes to God's authority. See? We're God's agent of authority in their life. You, you, my point is power touches us in all these different ways. And so at first you think it's kind of an odd topic that Jesus would spend his last discourse on the topic of power, but he realized when I'm gone and Pentecost happens, Holy Spirit is going to come down in power. Like, you guys are about to have it. So, here, now I'm officially getting ahead of myself. Let's do it. John 13, 1. Here we go. John 13, 1. We heard it read so well earlier. Let's look at it again now. Before the feast of the Passover, and that's important because Jesus is now heading to Jerusalem. Before the feast of the Passover, when he's going to be crucified, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now, if you've been with us through this series on the Gospel of John, if you've read it in its entirety, it's especially poignant. Over and over again, John has this code word, mine hour has not yet come, right? Uh, uh, when they ask him to turn water into wine, mine hour has not yet come. In chapter 7, they're like, they, 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 try to, they try to capture him, my hour has not yet come. They try to make him a king at one point, his hour has not yet come. He's on God's timetable. And in, in chapter 8, they even try to kill him, but he gets away. Why? His hour had not yet come. Over and over in the Gospel of John, his hour had not yet com come. Like a, like a chime in an ancient cathedral sounding the hour, his hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. His hour had not yet come. And here in John 13, his hour at last has come. You would not be alone if reading through the entire Gospel of John, if you got to John 13, 1, and if it gave you chills when you read it, you wouldn't be the first one. Many readers have experienced the sense of finality that now it's here. His hour had come. So that kind of emotional place gets you ready to listen to what Jesus is going to say. How, how is he going to prepare for the death, burial, and resurrection? What, what lessons is he going to give? What is Jesus' last lecture going to be? Well, here we go. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus Knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, so he did what? Before we go to the next verse, don't, don't miss verse 3. He's saying Jesus has undisputed, undeniable, universal authority and power in his life. And he knows it. He knows that the... <laughs> Say that, I mean, let that sink in. The Father has given all things into his hands. Ponder that for a second. God, who controls like galaxies and the universe and atoms and, and human destiny and wills and all of that, uh, is now given to Jesus. Jesus has ultimate, unlimited authority. I mean, while this is going on, while Jesus has real authority, the irony, of course, is we read in Luke's version of the gospel, what are the disciples talking about right now? While Jesus, who has all authority, is about to go to Jerusalem, you know what the disciples are talking about, right? They're trying to figure out what position in Jesus' political cabinet they're going to have when Jesus is about to get all the power, right? When God's about to hook us up and put us back on top, there's Peter and Andrew and James and John, and they're all, man, I think I'd make a good secretary of the treasury. And Andrew's like, man, I'm going to be secretary of the interior, right? Interior of my mansion, you know, right? I mean, they're ready to be rich. They're ready to be powerful. In fact, they're even fighting about who's going to be vice president. When Jesus gets into all the power, they think he's going to Jerusalem to be crowned, not crucified. Jesus, ironically, has all this power, but he perceives they need a little help in understanding the proper use of power. And so of all the things he could do, let me, let me put it this way. If you had real power, how would you use it? How would you wield that real power? Let me ask it this way. Uh, apparently, we're like, we're like nine days away from a national election. Uh, if you turn on the news, they, they, they hardly mention it. Um, <laughs> but we're nine days away from this national election. Where okay, in 2018, how do modern politicians use power? 
I mean, if you've, if you've been given real power, how have we seen it used? It's not always the best, right? So how do we expect? This, I'm just throwing it out here that maybe, just maybe, if you start to think about real power from on high, don't you sort of suppose that it looks like, verse 3, Jesus, knowing that he had all power right then and there, since he had all the power, did what? He called lightning from heaven and struck down Judas Iscariot. Rah, I'm, the, I'm the Lord, and I'm going I'm to show my dominance and my power. That's what we would expect him to do. He would have all his disciples line up and crown him right then and there. This is what verse 4, am I not wrong? If you were given real power, unlimited power, why not just demolish all your enemies? Trample death. Come be crowned. Have Judas kicked out. Have people come and start bringing gifts. Get ready for your military victory. I mean, if you knew you had real power, why not call the guys together and say, tomorrow we march on Jerusalem, and the day after that, it's Rome. After we take Jerusalem, we're going to march all the way to Rome. But Jesus, what will our army eat? You just bring five loaves of bread and two fish, and I'll do the rest. But Jesus, how will we cross the mighty Danube River? Thank you. It's funny because he can walk on water. But Jesus, what if they kill us? Yo, I'm just going to Lazarus y'all back. Like, we got this. Caesar cannot face a miracle bread fed water walking zombie army. Okay, we got this. Right? It's on. This is what we hey, Come on, right? He's been given all power. How do humans wield authority? When we're given real power. Let's use it. Here's what he does. With real, unlimited God power, he rose from supper, laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. And he poured water into a basin and began to wash the... (laughs) This can't be right. Mine says, he began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. Now, in this story, Jesus does something shocking. Um, Washing the feet was not altogether uncommon. Uh, In certain instances, a host would do it for his guests. If a host had money, more commonly, they would hire a lowly servant to do it for the guests. Occasionally, as a symbol, disciples would do it for their rabbis. What makes this shocking is that a rabbi is doing it for his disciples, that the guest is here doing it. Uh, uh, I mean, it's obviously a, I mean, we get that it's a dirty, smelly job. Uh, They don't eat like we do, right? We don't, I mean, we don't sit down and at at a a booth or a table and, um, uh, you know, we don't go over to the all kosher and uh, uh, sit down and like uh, 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 begin eating like this. Instead, we would lie down on these sort of couches, right? So do the math. You've got somebody's feet in your face and they've been walking all day, right? Everything, Jesus never moved like faster than three miles an hour, his whole ministry. That's why some of you, by the way, you're trying to catch up to God, you need to slow down. Uh, and I wish you Godspeed, right? You, you're just going too fast. He, 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 he you know, um, uh, uh, what am I trying to say? There's no, there's no like sewage system. You follow me? I mean, do I have to spell this out? You're walking on the same paths that the donkeys and the horses are walking on, and everybody's walking around with tevas, you know, or the chacos, right? <laughs> and the kind of which are gross already. And you're walking through those, you know, and uh, and then you sit down. That's why you'd say, well, what's the big deal? I'll just wash my hands. Yeah, the feet are important too, because now you got this person in your face. So they hire somebody to wash the feet. It was such a demeaning job that I read that some municipalities, and these must have been very progressive municipalities, they actually banned the practice as illegal. It was too demeaning. You couldn't even make your, 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 your slave do it, your servant do it. And here Jesus becomes the slave of slaves, the servant of all servants. And he begins washing the feet. Quite naturally, they are shocked. <laughs> it is so awkward that they, I, I imagine they're, they're, they're wondering what in the world is, is happening here. Peter, in verse 6, Peter only says, what everybody else is thinking, right? So it's so awkward. They don't, know, they don't know what to do. For one thing, he's not acting very much like a king, but this is a like, perversion of the whole, like, you're the Lord of everything. You're our teacher. See, they still think he's going to be crowned, not crucified. And so when he got to Simon Peter, he, he said to him, in, sort of in shock, Lord, you, like, is this for real happening? Lord, you wash my feet? 
And Jesus answered him, what I'm doing you do not understand now. Afterward, you will understand. And it's sure enough, they didn't realize what was happening now. Afterward, yes, it would all click later. That This is more than just a visual aid. Jesus was giving them sort of the last lecture. It was a perfect metaphor for his entire mission. He took off the outer garments and put on a servant's towel. Philippians says he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but Paul's reflecting on his whole ministry. He stripped off those robes of glory and took upon himself the form of a servant. It was a metaphor for his whole mission. He didn't just come to serve. He came to do the ultimate service, which was reconcile sinful humans to God. The ultimate humbling. And so Peter, this is so important. It's kind of like if I had to say, listen, this is, I I tried my hardest at the 8 a.m. And I'm I'm not sure I, 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 I got it across. So God's given me another opportunity here at the 1030. So it's it's the mulligan uh, sermon. Uh, 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 I hope it comes across. This is it. Like, this is what First Baptist needs to hear. This is what I need to hear. This is what you need to hear. Peter's objection. Peter said to him, you shall never wash my feet. Why? I'm going to try my hardest to explain this. And I I, kind of like feel like it's one of those things. You'll either get what I'm saying or you won't. And I'll I'll, I'll try to make as many of us as I can try to get what's what's in my head and what's in my heart. Because I think it's a word from God for us. (sighs) Let me say it. Let me do it this way. Have you ever been part of a foot washing service? Okay. Um, The Lord has given us baptism as an ordinance. He's given us Lord's Supper. And there's some debate about whether or not foot washing is literally to be a common institution. Like we do the Lord's Supper every uh, quarter. Maybe we should do a foot washing every quarter or something. Um, uh, I I don't know. I leave that debate up to smarter minds. But I do know that it is, I have been a part of it. I think it's biblical. And I think it, you know, it's it's okay. So if you would, ushers at this time, if everyone would take off your shoes. (laughs) I'm just kidding. (laughs) Like, it's about to get real up in here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, uh, we're, we're not going to do one. But, 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 but ponder this for a second. If you've ever been a part of one, let me ask you this simple question. And I, I have been, a, I've been both sides of this. Is it more humbling to bend down and wash someone's feet as a symbolic act of service? I mean, you know, we, all, we're a little, we have a little better hygiene in 2018, so it's not as necessary, but it's still an important biblical symbol. So let me ask you. Is it more humbling to bend down and wash someone's feet or to have your feet washed? Because I'll tell you, I've been on both sides of this. I have been both washer and washee. I I, I don't know what the objective form of that gerund is. But, but, But you with me? Ponder. At first you might think the humbling thing, the, the, the most humbling act is to wash someone's feet. I assure you, and those of you who are giving me some smiles and nods, if you've been on both sides of this, I assure you it's not even close. It's not even close. The most humbling thing is not to wash someone's feet. The most humbling thing in the world is to have your feet washed. I mean, it's, it's awkward, and it's embarrassing, and you just came for a church service, and now the stranger's touching your feet, and you've never even noticed how ugly your feet are until right now. They look, they look like hobbits. I mean, you just, and it's mortifying, and they're down there serving, and, it, and you just want to be like, no, 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 let me, you know what, you know what, here, you sit down, let me, let me do this, right? There's something about, there's something about maintaining your dignity when you're the one in control, you're washing the feet. See, you're doing this beautiful act. Isn't that good? Aren't I being a humble servant? You hear that? You hear that? Even in your act of humility, you can still have a little room for your pride. But when you're just a charity case having your feet washed, you got nothing. And having your feet washed crushes pride. Having your feet washed crushes pride. I believe, verse 8, Peter is having his pride crushed. And I don't know if that makes sense or not, but you'll either get that or you won't. You'll either understand that as long as I'm in control, as long as I'm the one who can give away the resources, but to be somebody's charity case, I don't know about that. As long as I can be the one serving. We, we, we want to be the one serving, but to be served, it crushes pride. 
And that's the only way to explain Jesus' response. Watch this. No, 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 Jesus, I'm here to serve you. I'm going to come to church. I'm going to raise my children in church. I come from a long line of good Christian people in Coleman County, and we're going to continue to give to the poor, and we're going to continue to do all the right things, and you're lucky to have a family like us on your team, God. A Christian is not, not first and foremost, I'm sorry, it's not. A Christian is not someone who serves God all their life. That, 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 we can talk about that definition as an ancillary byproduct, but first and foremost, a Christian is not someone who successfully serves God. A Christian is someone who has been wrecked by the grace of God. A Christian is someone who is in so desperate need of rescue that they cry out with no other hope in shame and in despair and in brokenness saying, rescue me, God, I'll be your charity case. Now we got a Christian who will then, you know what, ironically, they'll grow up and they'll serve God their whole life. But until you've had your pride obliterated, until you've had your pride crushed, Jesus says, it's the only way you get in. Look at, look at his answer. If I don't wash you, in other words, Peter, if, if, you don't, if we don't get this, that you ultimately don't serve me, unless you're okay with being God's charity case, you can't get in. He says, if I don't wash you, you have no share with me. That's a word for us. That's a word for us. If your pride is never crushed, wherein you know you are utterly unworthy of his grace, you can't get in. Some people would rather die than be somebody's charity case. And Jesus says, if that's the case, then it, it won't work. You are God's charity case. You and I are God's welfare case. Now, what's that do to your spiritual pride? Well, I'm not on anybody's welfare. We are, man. We're spiritually bankrupt. And if you ever do a good deed, you borrowed more grace to do it. So you're forever spiraling deeper and deeper into God's debt, and you got nothing to pay him back. If you could pay him back, you would borrow more grace to pay him back. You got nothing. I got nothing. And God's okay with this arrangement. And a lot of people are going to stumble over that. They're going to stumble over that. Why? Because they're looking for God in the far-flung reaches of the galaxy, and they miss him because God is kneeling at their feet serving them. And that is a, that is a tough pill to swallow because that is a pride killer. And a lot of us would rather be the one cutting the checks and serving and doing, the, doing that all day long. But to know that God had to serve us, that will demolish pride. And some people, they don't want to hear it. The, the early church father origin. See, is, okay, uh, isn't it something? Jesus went around. He didn't skip Judas. Like it never says, he's like, oh, I know what you're about to do. You know what? Wash your own feet. There he bends down and washes the feet of Judas, who's about to betray him. And he washes Peter. And it hardened Judas. At that, his pride, it, wasn't, it crushes Peter's pride and humbles him. And it hardens Judas. Finally, Satan's entered his heart. It's like, it's done. This is no way a king should act. This, perhaps, for Judas was the last straw. Because it's here that he went out. Remember, after this, he went out and he left. It, the betrayal was on. The early church father, Origen, said, isn't it something? Jesus, the same grace is being poured out. How is it that grace could harden one and, demo and soften the other. Origen says, oh, it's not that hard. After all, the same sun hardens clay and melts wax. It's like Peter was melted by this. Judas was hardened by this. Why? It comes down to pride. It comes down to pride. I think Peter gets it. You, you may say I'm overstating it, and I, I hope I s explained it sufficiently, but I believe Peter gets it, and I'll tell you why. When someone has been wrecked by the grace of God, when they realize they can bring nothing to God, they are just trophy cases of his grace. I am a wealth, I am God's welfare case. And when you can swallow that and when you can realize that, it frees you. And you want all the grace you can get. And here's the thing, you want not only grace poured out on you, you want grace splashed on other people too. You've met people like that. You ever meet people like that? Man, I heard, you was, I heard you were a born-again Christian. And they laugh and they go, I know. Can you believe it? <laughs> God could save even me. They have such a buoyancy, such a joy, such a freedom. Because they know. They don't doubt. They, they're just as shocked by grace as you are. 
They love it, and they want everybody to experience it. I think Peter gets it, because when he says, when Jesus says, hey, unless we do this pride-crushing thing where I'm down here serving you, washing your feet, unless your pride gets utterly obliterated and demolished, then you have no share with me. Peter says, well, that's the case. I love it. Well, then, Lord, not only my feet, but my hands and my head, I'm all in. I want to bathe in your grace. I think Jesus laughs at verse 10 and says, no, 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 we don't have to do that. But I, I don't think, my point is, I don't think Jesus is admonishing Peter. I think he's thrilled that Peter gets it. He's like, listen, the one who's bathed doesn't need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean. Don't let your kids read that and quote it back to you at bath time. It's completely out of context, and that's not at all what they, they, they don't, don't let them, don't let them do that. And you are clean, but not every one of you. What's his point? He's saying, listen, Peter, this isn't about the feet. This is about the heart. And I'm crushing your pride right now. You're getting it. And man, that's what it's all about. I just, I don't need somebody who is externally clean and checks all the religious boxes. Just give me somebody who knows their pride's been crushed by his grace. I can change the world with that. I can change the world with that. Give me a bad person in the best sense of the word over a good person in the worst sense of the word any day. And we can go with that, see? Now, he says not all of you are clean because he knew, verse 11, he knew who was going to betray him. That's why he said not all of you are clean. And that, 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 there again, that's why I say he's talking about their hearts, not their feet, because presumably he washed everybody about their heart. Verse 12 is a turning point. When he'd washed their feet, and put on his outer garments, resumed his place, he said to them, <clears throat> and this is great, you got to love the patience of Jesus because he actually said to his disciples, <clears throat> and I quote, do you understand what I have done to you? <laughs> and at this point, if you've been with us through the whole book of John, you know the answer's like, no, nope, no, nope, we, we never do. <laughs> but good, I mean, good for Jesus for like giving them a chance. And so obviously they don't even respond. I love that. There's nothing between verse 12 and verse 13. It just blank stares. And Jesus is like, okay, here we go. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. Now watch this. This is very important. We're, we're, we're applying this now to 2018 in Coleman, Alabama. This is for us. Okay. No, notice this. He says, you call me teacher and Lord. And you're right. That's exactly what I am. One of the first problems we're going to have to overcome in a sermon about power and authority. Listen. One of the first things you're going to have to overcome is you are going to have to admit, you're going to have to own up to the fact that you have more power and authority than you thought. When it comes to power, you actually have some. Now, if, look, if you're the CEO of a corporation everything, I'm talking to you, you're like, yeah, I've got it on my business card right here. Like, like powerful person. Okay, okay, I get it, right? But there's a lot of people that don't feel that way. They feel powerless, and I need to let you know, you have power. So the first thing I want you to see is, the proper use of authority is not bad. When, when Jesus said, hey, you guys have been calling me teacher and Lord, he does not say, you guys have like been calling me teacher and Lord, and that's like giving me the big head. So you know what? Like, it's, you shouldn't call me that anymore. I'm not really a teacher. I'm not really the Lord. No! He's like, you guys call me teacher, and you've started saying, Lord, good. That's exactly who I am, right? I mean, that, that, that's humility. You shouldn't tomorrow, if, if you're the boss, you should acknowledge you're the boss. You're like, hey, you guys lately have been treating me like the boss, and I'll give an instruction, or I'll give a work order, and you have to do it. Like, there's no need for that, you know? We could just, like, <laughs> okay, I got a better one. Uh, don't go to your kids after church today and be like, listen, the sermon was on power and authority, so whole new paradigm. We're just going to be buddies, right? We're going to be friends, Right? You're six, you pay the bills when you want, right? You'd say, that's insane. That's exactly right. That's exactly right. When your kid says, yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir, you say, that's exactly right. There's supposed to be some authority. There's supposed to be some respect. Why? Because I'm God's agent of authority in your life. So the first step is, don't deny it. Being humble is not the rejection of power. This is not a sermon on rejecting power. Power and money are very similar they're dangerous, but we need a theology of stewardship to protect our souls. I'll say it again. They're dangerous, right? But money's not the enemy. Power's not the enemy. But we need a character by which we can properly steward the money that God allows us to be in charge of, the power that God allows us to be in charge of. Humility is not acting like you don't have power when you have it. 
If you're talented at something, that's a kind of power. If you have time, if you have free time, you're the, you're the, you have power over that discretionary time. You have power over discretionary income. It, look, humil- I mean, we've got these incredibly gifted musicians. Are they supposed to come up here and be like, oh, God's given me this talent, and I'm incredibly gifted at this talent, but I don't want to get the big head. I want to be humble. So every Sunday when I'm asked to sing, I will always miss a few notes. Um, you know, just occasionally. Because otherwise, you know, no, that's not humility. Humility is not denying that you have some gift. It's not denying that God has blessed you with something. Humility is not denying that you have power. Humility is not thinking less of yourself. Humility is thinking of yourself less. It's taking your eyes off yourself. And instead leveraging what you've been given. Watch this. Uh, uh, if I then, here's, here's his lesson. If I then, verse 14, your Lord and teacher have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do just as I've done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. In other words, guys, guys, other than Judas, kingly power is about to come your way. You are about to get power. I'm talking about earth-shaking, Pentecostal, prison door opening kind of like power. Like heal people on the spot power. And here's the problem. With that kind of power, uh, the temptation to misuse that is going to be high. <laughs> and you're going to want to misuse that power and that authority. So I am giving you a model. I am showing you when you... When you think you have power, you remember me, the Lord Jesus. Think about the power I have, and how did I use it? Did I use it for myself? Did I use it for money? Did I use it to get power over others and manipulate them? No, I used it how? I leveraged every drop of that power. I leveraged every ounce of it. I leveraged it for the glory of God and the good of others. And the point of today's sermon is that. Leverage your power for the glory of God and the good of other people. It's a sermon on the proper use of power. God has made you a steward over some, it may, for some of you it's a very small area, but you have power. There are some of you that are just little children in here. You're six or seven years old. You can hear my voice right now. God has made you in charge. You have power over how clean you keep your room. So steward your power well. Listen to me, six-year-old, with great power, you know the rest. Steward the power. He's, it's a small domain, I understand. Maybe it's not even a full room. Maybe you and your brother share a room. You keep your side of the room clean, okay? And then we'll talk about judging his side later. That's another sermon. Don't be judgment. Don't be that kid. When did we outgrow that? Grown-ups, when did we outgrow that? Your domain is bigger or smaller than somebody else's, but it's about the heart. Don't you see? It's just a matter of scale. It's just a matter of scale. When you hear a sermon about power, if you're like me, you think about evil dictators. My mind goes to these, these evil, uh, President Assad in Syria, evil dictator. Where do I get off calling him evil? When he used chemical weapons on his own people. That, that, that was the spot I knew. He's evil. So President Assad, a wicked, evil man in Syria, wants to c- get power and keep power. And what does he do? He bribes people. He withholds freedom. He puts them in political prisons. And then he puts up propaganda and he manipulates others, right? My point is it's just a matter of scale. He withholds freedom. What if you withhold your time, dads? What if you withhold praise? What if you withhold Christian service from somebody that needs it? If he does it, people die. If you do it, it's just a matter of scale. Maybe people don't die. But something goes wrong in the world, right? It's just a matter of scale. He bribes people. What if we allow our children to parent us and we begin to do things for them that are not good just because we want in the short term to win some approval? A bri- it's just a matter of scale. He manipulates and puts up propaganda. What if we wear a mask in front of everybody and assure them we're better off than we really are? It's just a matter of scale. That's it. He's the dictator of Syria. What keeps me from being the dictator of 1624 Mockingbird Lane? It's just a matter of scale. Or, or God has given me dominion over this tiny little slice of the world. And some of your slices are bigger. You, you have dominion. Some of you are teachers. 
You have dominion over that classroom. Some of you are principals. You have dominion over school. Some of you are, are physicians. You have dominion over human health. I mean, this is incredible amounts of power. Some of you have dominion over resources and money. And what I'm saying is it's not to be rejected. It's to be leveraged for the glory of God and the good of other people. What if, like, imagine a world where around the coffee pot at work, everybody's gathering and there's a promotion up for grabs. And everybody says the same thing. Oh, that promotion, that promotion. Who do you hope gets it? And everybody says the same thing. I hope, I hope me, right? Everybody says the same thing. I hope it's me. But then right after they say, I hope it's me, they say, but you know what? If it's not me, I hope it's her. And everybody goes, yeah, I kind of agree. Because, you know, she's one of these born-again Christians. And again, I hope it's me. But if it's not me, I think I could live with that. Because she seems to treat everybody fair. And I just get the sense that if she were given power... I don't know how to say it. In my own words, she would like, and I know this doesn't make sense, she would leverage it for the glory of God and the good of our workplace. <laughs> no, no one would ever use those words. But, right? What if we had a world where people would like, they would dream that a born-again Christian would come into places of power because they say, you know what? They get it. For some reason, they have a model by which they operate that they leverage whatever power comes their way, not for themselves, but for the glory of God and the good of other people. Did it work? Sorry, I mean, did it work in the, life of the, in the lives of the disciples? Just point blank, did it work? Be because we actually get to see your life is still unwritten. We won't know if the sermon worked or not until you're tested and you're given power and we'll see how you leverage it. I also will be tested. But the disciples' story is written. It's written in the book of Acts. Did it work? The answer is, I'm happy to report, very much so. And I'll just summarize for you. The power comes in Acts 2. You may remember it. It's called Pentecost. The Holy Spirit comes down, fills them with power, and oh man, power. Power on display. The test comes one chapter later. Peter and John are walking along, and they see a man who's lame, and he's been there, you ready for this? From birth. And they're like, wow, that's crazy. Here's a guy who has this, this disability, this pain he's walking through, but it's been there since birth. I wonder if this man or his parents said that he was... Wait just a minute. And one of them looks at the other and is like, were you here a few weeks ago for Tom's sermon? It's like, yes, we, we call it John 9. <laughs> it's deja vu, bro. I know. And it hits them. It's like they feel God's power inside of them. They have God's power. Here's this man. Let's go for it. And the guy's like just hoping for a few bucks. He's like, hey, man, could you spare some change? And Peter and John are like, silver and gold have we not. Oh, but what we got, we're willing to give it. In the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. Dude gets up and walks, goes to the temple, and the whole crowd, you read in Acts 3, what does it say? The whole crowd is filled with wonder. They're like, Peter, Peter, John, John. I mean, they're, they're like, what just happened? They're ready. And now Peter's got all this power, power from God, power from the people, and here's the test. Here's the test. He's got it. He, I mean, they're putting his hand. He could do anything with him. So what does he do? Peter and John stand up before the crowds and looks out. And he kind of swings from the rim for just a few minutes. Is that what he does? Just looks around, just wants to drink it in. And he looks at them all and he says, now that is power. And John and I, for $19.95, payable in three easy installments, we will sell you this power. John, we're about to be rich. Is that what they do? Do they leverage that moment? Do they say, you know what, that is power. And uh, how many of y'all like under the governor, how many of y'all like Pontius Pilate? Boo. How many of y'all would like to make us king right now? Yeah. Is that what they do? They, 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 they gather the power? No. Do they look out of the crowd like, that was a lot of power. Ladies. Hola. Huh? Is this what they do? Is this what we see people in power do? They leverage it for themselves, whatever they give it themselves. And said, what does Peter do? He stands up in Acts 3 and what does he say? Why are you guys so filled with wonder and amazed? As if this power came from us. It came from Jesus, who's dead and buried and resurrected. And he begins preaching the good news of the gospel, and thousands are saved that day. He leveraged, when he got his moment, he leveraged that power for the glory of God, the good of others. It worked for them. What about you? What about me? I've seen it happen. Some of you are like, I don't, I don't, I don't have much power. Come on. No, 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 you've, you've used illustrations like people had real power. Like you're talking about CEOs and bosses and, and uh, uh, people with a lot of money. I don't have anything. You don't have anything. Can you pray? 
well, yeah, I guess I can pray. Then, then we could stop right there. You, you talk about the power of intercessory prayer. Are you leveraging that power for the glory of God and the good of other people? You say, well, I'm just a student. Let me tell you about students leveraging their power for the glory of God and the good of other people. I, uh, it happened. I saw it. I was in a class in seminary that I was instructed. People told me, you should take this class. It was so hard. I, I could not, I, I, are you sure I should enroll in this class? I could not pronounce the title of the class. Let me give you some advice, college students. If you're ever given the chance to sign up for a class and you can't even pronounce the title of the class, don't do it, bro. Like, you, the, the, and they told me, yeah, but the professor's going to retire, and he's really hard, and he's really mean, but he's going to retire. You'll never get a chance to take it again. You should take it. And I'm like, but I can't. But I later learned the title of the class was Prolegomena to Understanding the Philosophical Underpinnings of Theology. Prolegomena. Later I found out it means introduction or prelude, to which I'm like, why can't we just say introduction? You know, we all speak English. We could use it. Okay. Prolegomena to the, theological, to the philosophical underpinnings of theology. And I knew, I knew I was going to fail this class. And, uh, it was going to be bad. And there was a student there, and his name was John. John was playing with a totally different deck of cards than we were. Um, uh, he, he, uh, you talk about power. He, um, how do I explain it? Like, he was just a lot smarter than all. I mean, we would come in from the weekend and be like, what'd you do? And what'd you do? And John would be like, I translated um, some of Bart from German to English, right? And we're like, whoa, what class was that for? And he's like, what do you mean what class? This is what I do for fun. I'm like, whoa. He's like, what'd you do, Tom? I was like, played Nintendo like the whole weekend. Like, man, I, I saved the princess and you, you're out. Okay, so I got nothing. And, and this guy, he's so smart and um, he realizes we're all going to fail. And I'm sitting in this class like, this is not going to work. And I'll never forget, John comes to a few of us and he's like, hey guys, um, I seem to have a pretty good handle on this stuff. And that's an amazing thing. He didn't deny it. He wasn't like, oh, I don't know. And he was like, uh, would, would it be helpful for you guys if I like, I don't know. It was a, there was, oh, sorry, this is important for the story. There's only two grades. You write out a midterm, you write out a final. Right there, blue books, old school, right? You, a, a midterm, a final. That's it. That's the whole, the whole course based on those. Hey, a week before the midterm, he says, would it be helpful if we had a study group where I like kind of told you guys what I know and maybe help you through this, whatever? And we were like, me need help philosophy. <laughs> like it was, you know, we're like cavemen. We're like, yes. John sits us down. I'll never, to this day, I'll always remember, he's sitting like, we were in a dorm room. He was on the bed. We were all like on the floor around him like his disciples. Speak again, you know, writing as fast as we could. And uh, I'll tell you this, um, John, uh, let's be honest, John, could, John had power over us in a way, didn't he? Didn't he? Like in a place like that, I mean, it's seminary, so we're supposed to help each other. It's not supposed to be competitive. But let's be honest, like he could have withheld all that information that he had and then on the test, he could have made his star shine all the more brightly. But instead, he took that power and he leveraged it for the glory of God and for the C minus of your pastor. <laughs> I'm telling you, I've never been prouder of a C minus in my whole life. I rocked the biggest, baddest C minus. In fact, it was a B minus, and this professor was so mean, he came in, he said, the TAs graded your papers, and because I just assumed they were all too high grades, I uh, systematically lowered each one a letter grade without reading them and left. <laughs> so C minus. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. This guy was a Christian. Yeah, I know. The, it's, it's, it's amazing. Yeah. So even that you're a student, you see what I'm saying? You have to be creative maybe, but you leverage your power for the glory of God and the good of other people. What's the alternative? Withhold it? Keep it to yourself? What? We know the end of the disciple story. What will your story be? How will you this week leverage your power for the glory of God and the good of other people? Chuck's going to come and lead us in a time of response. And as he leads us in this response time, I want us to ponder this deeply. How, how will you leverage your power this week? Or maybe you should ponder this. How? Like, how can a person do this? I mean, what, what, what made my friend John in seminary able to do that? Like, what made, what made Peter and John in their moment able to leverage their power for the glory of God and the good of other people? Does that mean we're supposed to be doormats? No. It goes back to verse 3. And while Chuck's preparing, just put up that verse real quick. Look, look, look. Jesus, remember this verse? He knew. He knew who he was. And he knew whose he was. And that's the only way he was able to serve. Let me say that again. He knew exactly who he was. And he knew whose he was. And that's why he was able to serve. See, people who don't know who they are. They don't know they're loved by God. People who have not responded to the gospel. They have to fight for every last dollar. 
But a Christian who knows who they are, knows whose they are, they can give generously. Why? Because I have a heavenly father who watches over the sparrows. and I consider the lily of the fields. He's going to take care of me. You look at like these people who have to fight for control. You, Christian, you don't have to fight for control. Why? Because you know who you are and you know whose you are. And you have a heavenly father who controls everything in the universe. And you can relax and let God be God this week. He's got it. These people, they have to be anxious. I mean, you realize that without the gospel, you should be anxious. You should be scared to death. You've got a universe you have to control. It's all up to you. But with God, with God, I don't have to control it. I don't have to control other people. I don't have to manipulate. Why? I can be free. Why? Because I know who I am and I know whose I am. And everybody's out there fighting for approval. I don't have to go out there and fight for approval. Why? I have a heavenly father who stamped approval on the cross of Jesus Christ and I am in Christ. And here, imagine, like just imagine for a minute, like us coming forward to pray and commit our life to Jesus. I'm just saying, ponder me. In a minute, in just a minute, literally, stand to our feet. And some, you know, it's possible you come forward, commit your life to Jesus Christ. But imagine, in your mind's eye, we stand to our feet and we see it's none other than Jesus Christ himself who comes forward, who kneels down and commits his life to God for us. Does that not mess with your pride a little bit? It's, 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 it's Jesus coming to pray at your feet feet for you, to love you, to serve you. I, lo- I just want our pride obliterated this morning and turn us into servants who are so free to love God, to love other people without the need to please or to prove but just because of his incredible matchless love for us. Let's stand to our feet. Lord Jesus, forgive us when we have missed what you're up to because we were looking in the far-flung reaches of the sky and said you were down at our feet serving us. God, I pray that, that what that does to our pride would be reflected in everything we do this week. We serve others. We love others. We leverage what power you give us in this world. We leverage it not for ourselves. We leverage it for your glory and for the good of those around us. Grant that to us in Jesus' name. Amen. You know the time of response is just meant to be that. It's time of response. As Chuck sings and plays, and he'll give us some music with which we can sing along and worship. It could be you want to pray right where you're at. You want to come forward. You want to kneel here at this front row and pray. And uh, You want to make us aware of some decision that's on your heart. All of this is acceptable. The only thing that's not acceptable to God would be to, to just tune out this holy moment or to allow the fear of what other people think keep you from moving. Those things are not acceptable because they're not necessary. They're not needed. There's freedom in the house of God. He loves us. He loves you. So let's respond as we see fit from the Lord. Chuck